Alrighty, so today we're going to review the busiest night of Leeds Cup action as we had seven games that happened last night and there was a variety of resort. I mean, we saw some games that were blowout, we saw some close games, some come from behind resort, but what we did not see yesterday was PK shootout. And I think that's the first time in a day of Leeds Cup action that we did not have a PK shootout because up to this point there's at least one PK shootout that happened in these games of each night of Leeds Cup group action. But with that being said, let us actually get into the first game. And the first one is Montreal versus DC United. Now, there was four games that was happening between 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. And while the other three games were not close whatsoever, and by near the end of the game, it was pretty much over, I really spent a lot of time watching this one because this one still was kind of up for, for grabs. And this is where, you know, you see I wrote more notes on this one compared to this game, this game, and also uh, this game, at least in the latter part, that is. Now, in the first half, uh, there was actually a mad scramble for the, the ball after Duke actually rounds the, the keeper, and his shot was actually blocked, but uh, it rebound to a couple of Montreal players who could not slot sit home. Uh, though on the other end, Siwas would deny Juan from close range, and there was definitely no feeling out period in this one. Like, both of these teams were pressing to get the opening goal. Uh, Benteke with heads at wide from the corner, and the reason why I say it's, there's no feeling out here in this one is that we had had a lot of games that had those kind of moment where maybe there's a bit of a feeling out here i guess we're not seeing it now because you know there are some desperation that we're starting to show in some of the these teams that is either uh trying to book their ticket into the next round or trying to stay off elimination uh but in the 14 minute as i said uh ben Teke would heads it wide from the corner before he hits one right to see was in the 18 minute christian ben Teke kind of had a typical christian ben Teke kind of night close but no cigar. Uh, in the 20th minute, Dahomey would puts it just high as I thought DC was pressing for the opener. Uh, though we did get through a period where there was not much happen. In fact, the next chance then came until the 41st minute when Opoku would fire it just wide from close range. But we do head to halftime scoreless between both of these teams. Now the second half, uh, not much happened. Really came come out of the gate. The shots were still 6-5 uh, for DC as we hit the 55th minute mark. In fact, that was the exact same Dot Toto as we head to halftime. Uh, Kurubo would then puts one hopper right to Bono before Bono denied Brogians in the 62nd minute. So Alex Bono getting a rare start uh, for DC in, in this one. Uh, but I thought Montreal kind of found their stride because, you know, in the first half they didn't really play relatively well. But they were starting to find their stride and were looking for the opening goal. But instead, it would be DC that gets the opening goal and kind of against the run of play too as Eric Hurtado would score to give DC a 1-0 lead. Yeah, Eric Hurtado is still in this this league. For those that was wondering where is he actually is, he's at now with DC United. And he came off the bench in this one, making an instant impact. But this wasn't just a gift from uh, him. I mean, he came off with a WTF turnover from Matthew Schreiner. A very rare mistake there because Schreiner has had a really good season this year for Montreal. But yeah, just a bad giveaway there. And Montreal was pu punished. Uh, Lapinayan did try to respond, but he hits one right to Bono before Duke would also hits one right to Bono. Trainier then had a shot that was clear off the line by Williams in the 79th minute. Montreal was pressing for this equalizer. You can start to see DC was trying to hold on to this one nothing lead, trying to do what you should not be doing on the road, which is just kind of hold on for dear life and hope you get a one nothing win. Uh, Opoku would then puts it wide from long range, and then Banteke was in on goal. And again... You know, Christian Menteke had a very typical Menteke night where, you know, just, just, he, he, he's, he's a player that can be very frustrated where, where there's times where you could see that he can put away chances. And then there's times where some of the easiest chances that he has, he missed it. And this one, he missed wide there. And you just wonder, will that chance come back to haunt DC? Because we saw, saw this before. We saw it in the, the game between Cincinnati and Sporting KC, where I think Kyrie Shelton had a big opportunity to kill the game off he didn't and Cincinnati got themselves the equalizer in the 98th minute but fortunately for DC it didn't happen uh to, to them as Ibrahim did try to go on his bike try to score a spectacular goal but he missed that one wide as in the end DC they hold on to win one nothing in this one and I think with this win they're now moving on into the the, the next round of the the group stage of this tournament but the shots in this one 14 shots for the eight that dc had five shots on goal for the three that dc had five shots off target for the three that dc had two shots on the block for the four that montreal has and possession wise 55 percent possession compared to the 45 percent possession that dc has in this game so you know montreal they look like they were on point in terms of moving on now all of a sudden they, they could be 
be facing elimination because and it all depends on that game between dc and pumas because if pumas does win i believe they they will uh montreal would would be eliminated they're just gonna have to hope that dc wins or if this goes to a, a pk shoot shootout which in in sense if actually if it goes to a, a pk shootout um if the dc does get get a draw that uh, out of that it didn't matter either way so the, the game can't go to a pk shootout in, in montreal state and this is also where you know the, that that game they had against pumas when they blow that two nothing lead i mean as much as i talk about the resilience that montreal did show is that going to come back to haunt them because of not getting all three three points and only getting the the two points because as much as it's great to win in a pk shootout you do uh lose that that point and in this tournament where group stage games are very li limited and, and every point is valuable yeah that could come back to haunt on Montreal now that they're they're on the back back foot and really are, are hoping DC can take care of the business against Pumas. That being said, moving on in the next match is NYCFC and Toronto. So this looks like the old NYCFC that we know. Though again, how much is that because of the fact that NYCFC play well in this game and also that TFC are just bad. In all caps. I mean, this is a TFC team that you know. I was hoping that you know, with this new tournament, uh, they they might take it take it seriously and maybe just a change change uh, of scenery. I mean, we kind of saw saw it with Colorado too, where Colorado did at least get get uh, as bad as they have been this season. They at least show some sort of fight. TFC didn't do that in, in this one, and it didn't. They didn't do it in in a in in a big big way. Uh, in the fifth minute, Bakra did try to score his first goal for NYCFC, but he hits one right to Johnson uh, as NYCFC was on the front foot early. By the way, Sean Johnson, I gotta feel bad for him because his backline just completely gave up on on him, and this was definitely a rude awakening for his time returning uh, to face against his former team. Uh, Perusa then then hits it that was actually denied by Freeze. That would actually turns out to the, be the best chance that TFC would have uh, in this game because in the 30th minute. NYCFC takes the lead. It's uh, Maxine Chenot scoring from Rodriguez to make it one nothing in favor of NYCFC. It was a free header for Maxine Chenot. I mean, just criminal set piece defending from TFC, and criminal defending would kind of be the the story for NYCFC in this one because in the 45th minute, uh, Mansu Bakra would score his first goal for NYCFC to make it two nothing. Not long after, Rodriguez would make it three nothing. I mean, this literally came off from the kickoff like this. This one uh, was just a terrible giveaway from TFC. And while it definitely was, was a, a fortunate goal for Santi Rodriguez and NYCFC because it took a big deflection that looped over the head of Sean Johnson, yeah, uh, you cannot turn the ball over on in, in your own half uh, from the kickoff. And yeah, NYCFC was comfortable. They were leading 3 nothing In the second half, uh, Petrotza did have a rare chance for TFC, but the post denied him there. So as bad as TFC was... Uh, they were getting no help uh, by the post in this one, too. In fact, in the 56th minute, it would be 4 nothing in favor of NYCFC as Jason would score from Krufe to make it 4 nothing in favor of NYCFC. The Toronto defense just completely checked out. Like, like there was no defense that was found from TFC. And again, got to feel bad for Sean Johnson because he, he, he basically was just, just used as shooting target uh, up to this point. Uh, Morales then trying to make it 5, but he missed... That one wide. And then in the 75th minute, it was 5-0. As Talos Magno would score from Rodriguez to make it 5-0. And Ambika in that moment. The thing that I noticed in that, that goal uh, is that Ambika basically did his best James Harden impression. So, you know, James Harden, how, how he tends to play no de defense. And there's always a meme about, about him playing no defense in basketball. Ambika basically did the same thing. I mean, that was just... I think that moment might be might might be a moment where we might not see Mbika play play for for this team for a very long time because you know there's one there there is there is one thing to say there's lazy defending, and then there's where what Mbika did that to that one. I mean, if you're a TFC fan, I mean, I know you're already mad uh, uh, how bad your your defense has been, but that kind of performance just 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 take it to to the point where you you just hope you never see that player plays again. Like just jogging back like even when magno was trying to round johnson because was just standing there like he was just standing there watching while, while the, the play goes along almost like he completely get, get, gave up on, on that play and i get it yes you're down five or down four nothing up to this point and there's nothing to fight but that 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 kind kind of character that's been shown by these tfc players 
Fans kind of sum up this season, and I really think this season that they, they have to nuke this team. Like, they absolutely have to nuke this team. They have to start from scratch, and there's got to be changes that has to be made because this has just been a complete disaster uh, this season from, from the CFC team, and just watching them kind of makes me mad too. And I'm not a TFC fan, and but even watching this kind of display makes me, me angry and want to make me, me rant about, about this team. And it doesn't get better for them, too, because in the 84th minute, uh, TFC sees red. And Shane O'Neill get his second yellow card, which just add insult to injury. And the full-time whistle was actually blown before we hit the 90th minute, which I think for T TFC's sake, that feel like it was a mercy kill. Like, it, it really doesn't mat matter if we play the full 90 minutes or not. This was just a, a performance that just just an indictment of the, this team. Just, just absolutely... Completely atrocious performance at every degree to a point where they absolutely have to nuke this this team in the off season. But the shots in this one: eleven shots for the five that TFC had, eight shots on goal for the one that TFC had, three shots off target for the two that NYCFC had. Both team had one shot that was blocked in possession wise, fifty one percent possession compared to forty nine percent possession that TFC has in this game. And as much as Toronto was absolutely atrocious in this game, gotta give a lot of credit to NYCFC. Again, they needed. This badly because you know this season we haven't seen this version of NYCFC looking like the mold self and scoring on a, on a free flowing kind of way and they're just hoping that that of course is going to be the, the same case and maybe for once Red Bull Arena kind of treated them well because coming into this game that was kind of the narrative of well they're playing at Red Bull Arena and it looks like they're probably in for another loss I mean the good news is they did play against Tor Toronto and again this is where it kind of gets gets tricky for NYCFC because. Again, how much is this the fact that NYCFC has started to look, look much better or the fact that TFC is just that bad of how, 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 how they play in this game? But that being said, uh, moving on in terms of the next match is the Union and Caleta. And in these next three games, I'll talk about how neither of these games was closed. And this was one of those one where, yeah, I mean, the Union, they, they show you why. They, they are a team that I think could be considered one, one of the fate favorites uh to win this tournament and i think also this game just kind of shows you something that i'll talk about in terms of what i learned from this leeds cup tournament is that some of the worst team in liga mx he's yeah they are not good whatsoever and when they do play against a relatively good or even an average mls team oh it, it there there's a lot of golf in in, in class in, in terms of because as much as i know this was actually a rough rough day uh for mls team when they face against some of the best liga mx East team this was a rough day in, in the opposite direction in terms of Liga MX's team. Some some of those ones that are bad uh, facing, again, some really good MLS team. Now, in the first half, it was almost one nothing when Gastag puts it into the back of the net, but the goal was disallowed uh, for offside on the development of play. I think Damon Lowe was in an offside position when that free kick was coming in. Uh, and then in the 10th minute, if there, there was actually a check to see whether or not if Uru foul Lopez was actually worthy of a red, and it was actually Uru kind of uh, swing his arm toward toward uh, Lopez. Now, at times, we, we've seen before where, you know, when you see a Liga MX kind of opponent, uh, when that happens, you can see that that Liga MX player may be trying to dive and maybe win, draw a, a red card there. But I, I think that was actually a, a vicious kind of kind of swing of the arm, and they actually didn't send Uru off for that. I mean, I was kind of surprised, and I think the Union got away with one there, and especially Michael Uru got away with that one because, I mean, when you intentionally uh, swing your arms toward, toward, low, toward an opponent head, that's a red card. And and that, I, I think, think the Union were very lucky, the fact that it was still 11 v 11 up to this point. So really not much happened besides the offside goal and the, the questionable VAR decision. Also, this won't be the last time we talk about how there was some bad refereeing uh, decision because again this leads cup the the referees in this in comes from talking calf so you know that there's going to be some some games where there's going to be some really bad refereeing and this i think was one of them uh martinez then fires it is it wide from long range because why not jose martinez is really feeling it ever since uh he's now got two goals to his name uh but in the 30th minute gas tag puts it in he scored here from elliot to make it one nothing in favor of the union before a couple of minutes later Penalty was given to the Union after the Coleto goalkeeper Arana would fought down Carranza in the box. Gastek steps up to take the penalty. He doesn't miss, and he 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 doesn't in this one either as he slots it home to make it 
two nothing in favor of the Union, and it would be three nothing as Nathan Haria would score from Bueno to make it three nothing in favor of the Union, and the route was on. Like this is where if you're Colette though. Yeah, this could get ugly for you because we've seen this before with the Union. Once they score one and they score two free in a quick succession, don't be surprised the scoreline could be five or six, six nothing thing by the end of t tonight. But we do head to halftime with the Union leading three nothing in the second half. Uh, Arana would deny low from long range as the Union again continued to, to take complete control of this game. Low then looked like he scored the fourth goal for the Union, but for the second time, Tonight, uh, the goal was just allowed for offside, and this time it was Damian Lowe that was in an offside side position uh, again, and this one was actually much more clear than what we saw in, in the, the first disallowed goal. But nevertheless, a penalty was given to the Union again, as this time it's Galeta brought down Bueno in the box. Gastek, of course, steps up to take the penalty. Like I said, he doesn't miss, miss from the spot, and he doesn't here in this one, as he made it 4-0 in favor of the Union. Lopez then had a rare opportunity for Coletta though, but he hits it right to Blake. And really, as the time winds down, I thought the Union started to take their foot off the gas. Maybe a little bit too much, because it did allow Coletta though, to get one back. As in the 84th minute, Sandoval would score from Jonathan Torres to make it 4-1 in this one. And then Blake had to deny uh, Garcia from the free kick. So, Andre Blake hasn't had a lot to do in this game, but, you know, he he's probably upset the fact that he... He gave up uh, his clean sheet in this one and make sure he's not going to concede another one. And in the 89th minute, the Union does restore their four-goal lead. It's Jack McGlynn scoring from Bueno here to make it 5-1 in this one. So for Jesus Bueno, I mean, I know he would really love to score a goal after in the last game against Tijuana that he was absolutely snake bin. He's probably happy, the fact that he at least got on the assist chart a couple uh, of times in this game. But yeah. In the end, 5-1 uh, was the final score for the Philadelphia Union and the shots in this one. 12 shots coming to 9 that Coletto has. 4 shots on goal for the 6th that the Union has. 3 shots that was off target for the 4th that the Union has. Both teams had 2 shots that was blocked and possession-wise it was actually dead even at 50%. And like I said, you know, the Philadelphia Union, I, I, I think this team team is a team that... I mean, these these last two games where they face against the Liga and Mekis team, I mean, it's been relatively le le e easy for them but again it's again some really bad bad league at mekis team and i'll say what i said before and i'll say it again uh when you see some of these bad league at mekis team these teams that are not not considered to be the powerhouse in that 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 league yeah they are very bad and when they do face against a, a, a good mls team or even the average mls team they're just going to get absolutely slaughtered as what we saw in this one and speaking of which that kind of is the same case in the next game where it was also the same score line uh, between New England and and Atletico de San, de San Luis, though I kind of put the scoreline opposite because uh, Atletico de San Luis was the, the 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 home team in this one, but really the resort was the same, an MLS team beating a Liga MX team 5-1. Though I will say, when you look at the how this game turns out, uh, you know, while the Union was dominant in this game against Cadetto, it was actually a little bit clo closer. And I, I think when you look at the stats line and also look at how this game played out, I think the scoreline was a little bit de de deceiving where, you know, New England took uh, advantage of their chances and then they go down to Louis, uh, San Luis uh, didn't. And it also kind of is the case when you have Georgie Petrovic is in goal for the New England Revolution. But in the first half, uh, the first shot of the game did see Bo hits one right to Sanchez. For Mark Anthony K try to score his first goal for New England, but he puts that one wide, and I thought it was a lively start for the Rams. They were looking to try to get the opening goal, though the first shot for San Luis did happen as Petrovic had to come up with a save to deny Chavez from close range. But in the 15th minute, Baroni would score here to make it one nothing as he scored from Bo to make it one nothing in favor of the refs. Little did we know this would be a monster night for Giacomo uh, Veroni. In the 19 minutes, Sanchez would deny Bo from close range, and then Buck would hit one right to Sanchez, and he absolutely rifled that one. You know Noah Buck is, is bangers only, and he almost scored another one here. Uh, Bilbao then had a shot that took a deflection, but shook the, the post there. So again, you know, you know, and there goes the San Luis there. They're not backing off in this one. And they show that in the 22nd minute as they got the equalizer is Demovich. He scored from Bilbao to make it one nothing in favor, or not one nothing, but ties the game up at one apiece in this one. And that was an absolute banger from Klemovich. I mean, he absolutely rifled that one. Petrovic had no chance in terms of saving that, that one. But the good news for the Revs is that the game didn't stay tied for long as they retake the lead in the 29th minute as both would get on the score sheet 
to make it 2-1 in favor of the Rams. Uh, it would be 3-1 just two minutes later as, unfortunately, Dominguez would score an own goal there. And then in the 39th minute, Baroni would score again. This time he scored from Bo to make it 4-1 in favor of New England. It came off a lightning counterattack from the, the Rebs, and they were hitting on all cylinder. I mean, just three goals in, in 10 minutes has completely blown this game wide open. Uh, Mark MTK then looked to make it number five, but he hits that one high there. And then uh, uh, Ventino would hit one right to Pesh before Heal would fire it wide from close range. And we had to have time with New England with an emphatic 4-1 lead over Atletico de San Luis. Now in the second half, uh, Bo would put it wide from close, and then Vitino would put one right to Pechvich, and I thought despite the, the scoreline, the game was still very wide open. I mean, you know, Atletico then San Luis, uh, they could easily feel sorry for, for themselves, but they were still attacking. Like, they were still trying to get, get a goal, goal back, and this is where if you New England, yes, you're leading 4-1, but you got to be careful, because if Atletico then San Luis get that second one, there's going to be that belief that maybe they can come back from this one. Now, the good news is that didn't happen because after Hugh puts it just wide from close range, in the 60th minute, Baroni would get his hat trick. He scored here from Brandon Bay to make it 5-1 in favor of New England. So congratulations to Giacomo Baroni becoming the first player in Leeds Cup tournament to score a hat trick in a, a game here. And yeah, that pretty much put all in doubt. Uh, Sambria then hits one right to patch finish before Bo would look to try to get number six, but he was denied by, by Sanchez there. And yeah, in the end, New England with a 5-1 victory. But like I said, the, when you look at the, the stats and the and how this game plays out, it was a, maybe a little bit closer than what you thought, thought a blow out uh, this game would look like. As the shots of this one, 16 shots committed, 15 that Atletico de San Luis has. Shots on goal was very tight too. Seven shots on goal committed, eight that New England has. Three shots off target for the seven that New England has. One shot that was blocked for the five that Atletico de San Luis had. And possession was 51% possession compared to 49% possession that San Luis has in this one. And again, I, I think you could clearly say that this was just one of those games where one team were, were better in terms of finishing, the other wasn't. And that's why we saw the emphatic scoreline that we saw in this game. But that being said, I am now going to switch boards and look at the last three games as part of a busy seven-game night action in terms of the Leeds Cup group stage action on Wednesday night. So moving on in the next game is RSL and Monterey, and this was also another game where the scoreline was very deceiving in terms of how uh, this game played out. In fact, I think this game is even more deceiving because this feel like it was one of those games where, you know, one team was, was just being the more clinical side. The other team, despite were the better team in this one, which I thought RSL was the better team in this game. But the finishing was just not there. And and I feel like that that seems like it's a similar story that we've seen with RSL this season. Where as good as RSL has been this season, there's been times where at home in, in, in this season where they have ha they have dominated their opposition and have, have so many chances. They're unable to put it away. And maybe I think that could be a, a concern if you're RSL, especially with the way way that you're on. You're going to ha maybe have one of the, those games in a big, big moment. Uh, where you're unable to put away your chances, and that was kind of the case, again, in this one against Riados. Now, early on, it was actually a nervy moment for Gavin Beavers, as he was in go you know, in this one. He tried to dribble it out, tried to be a little bit too cute, and he got, got away with it, because uh, despite getting it wrong, he was still able to recover it. Though, on the other end, Andrade would deny Arango from close range, and then Savarino would put it wide from close. I thought it was a positive start for RSL. They were looking to get the opening goal, but instead, it's Riados the one that gets the opening goal. And it's unfortunate here. Uh, Justin Glad would score an own goal here, and that kind of is a foreshadow of the, the bad luck that RSL would had throughout this game. Uh, Arango did try to respond, but he hits that one high. Before in the 13th minute, the first shot of the game for Riados. Goes into the back of it too. Uh, it's Herman Bedarami. He scored from Aguirre to make it 2 0 in favor of Riados. Despite the shots were 3 1 for RSL up to this point, uh, they find themselves 2 0 down. Like that, that's something you do not see happen a, a, a lot where, where one team could be outshot by that amount. And yet they found themselves 2 0 up. Uh, Ruiz then puts it high from the free kick before Vera had a free header but missed. That one, one high there. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that RSL was pressing to get one back, just wonder, is this one of the, those nights where they're finishing it is just poor and that it's just not going to be be their night? And there was plenty of sign that, that have shown that too because when you basically had those kind of opportunity and especially when you're, you're basically playing better and still find yourself 2 nothing down, 
Yeah, it looks like it's probably going to not be, be your, your night here. Uh, though in the 26th minute, Beavers did deny Funes Mori on a looping header. And then Vera, uh, I thought he got away with a dog so here. Because if this was not an offside call, I think this would have been a denial of goal score opportunity. Because you can clearly see, see uh, he bought down Meza, who was in on goal there. But because of the offside that, that was called, uh, he was saved because, because uh, 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 of that. So... Yeah, uh, in the 36th minute, Arango would hit the sign anything. By the way, that's probably one of the only things that kind of went right for RSL in, in, in this game. But in the 40th minute, Rubin had an empty net to shoot here, but he slipped. And I immediately wrote, it looked like it's just not going to be RSL not, night in this one. I mean, when you have that opportunity, and I know Rubio Rubin, uh, he had some, some of these moments where he missed some easy chances, and this is an example of it. Again, leading up to this, it just looked like it, it, it's one of those nights for RSL. And I'm pretty sure RSL fans probably see it too. That, uh-oh, here we go again. Is this going to be like that team, team we saw in the beginning of the season where finishing was just not not there? Uh, Beavers then denied Rojas from close as we, we had to have time with Ryan. Was leading 2 nothing despite the fact that RSL had plenty of chances. In the second half, that kind of continued. Arango had a shot that was deflected and goes wide before Julio puts it wide from close range. Arango then had another opportunity, but he puts it high from close range. If Chicho Arango is not being clinical in terms of their, his finishing, you know it's RSL probably is not going to be, be the same too. But in the 70th minute, uh, the post would deny Arango on the header, and again, RSL is just getting blue ball. It, it, it just wasn't going to happen. Like I would say that as much as they had a lot of chances in this one, we could play another 90 minutes in, in this one, and RSL probably wouldn't score because of how bad the, their finishing is. And because of how bad their finishing is and how clinical Riados is, it's no surprise that Riados would get that third goal. And it's Benarami. He scored again here from Meza to make it 3 0 in favor of Riados. That was just a backbreaker for, for RSL that trying to get one back, trying to set up a grandstand finish. Arango then hits one right to Andrada, and then Beaver had to rob for. Betarama, who were also trying to, to join Giacomo Veroni of be, being the, the fir, first two players to score a hat trick in the Leeds Cup tournament. Uh, but Beaver says no, he didn't. He robbed him of his hat trick from point blank range. And yeah, in the end, uh, Monterey would win 3 1, one or uh, 3 0 in this one. And also, by the way, I accidentally put the, the shot total wrong here. Let me just. Just change that real mm -hmm. quick because I, I, I realized that immediately because when I look at it, there is no way that RSL only had eight shots compared to 15 that Riados has. And this is actually the correct one uh, with RSL having 15 shots compared to eight that Riados had. But the story of this game is the shots on goal. Five shots compared to just three. And actually, let me write this a little bit better here. Yeah. Compared to just three shots on goal that RSL had. Three shots off target for the eight that RSL had. No shots that was blocked for the four that RSL had. And possession-wise, 53% possession compared to 47% possession that Riados has in this game. But overall, you know, I would say that when you look at the, this game, there, there's definitely some po positive coming out of this one. I mean, you know, for RSL, yes, it's very frustrating that this game could have gone either way if they, they would have find their, their finishing. But they can definitely go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the, the best te te team uh, in this tournament, which many people would say that Riados are, are going to be considered one of the favorites of winning this tournament. But again, I go back to what I said about the finishing with this team. I mean, there's just been times this season where, where there's games where they're, they they just just kind of getting blue ball because of their bad finishing. And in a knockout tournament, you cannot have that that kind of game appearing in one of these games because if that happens, then they're 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 screwed. Like they're they're pretty much much done in 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 ter terms of moving on to the next round if RSO has w one of these kind of kind of games where it's just frustrating to see because they play well but the finishing was just not there for them but now moving on in terms the next match is the Galaxy and Leon so again you know Leon is another team that I, I would consider to be one one of the favorites um in this tournament and it kind of showed that in this game against the LA Galaxy now the first shot of the game did see Tyler Boy hits it right to Kota before uh, Mekovic would uh, rob Rubio, uh, but it actually fall right to Bar Barrero, who, yeah, he's the one to have this one back because he, he should have scored this one instead of putting that over the bar. Uh, Rubio then puts it wide on the header, and despite the Galaxy kind of dominate possession, I think possession was 66 to 33 in favor uh, of them, or 34 that is. 
the the back line was very shaky. They were having a tough time in terms of dealing with with this Leon attack that was very lethal. Uh, there was a huge shout for a penalty from Leon that was not given, and then in the 42nd minute, uh, Mikovic would deny Rubio from close range. And Novak Mikovic, I mean, even though this is his first start, he was holding his own. Like, and I wouldn't be surprised that he may be be in the conversation here in terms of the goalkeeping position. I mean, I know the Galaxy had, had have their there are two goalkeeper in Kinsman and Jonathan Bond, but don't be surprised if Nova Mikovic would play into the conversation because I thought he had a good game in, in this one, considering even though this is his first start. Uh boy then missed wide from close in the third man stoppage time, and we do head to halftime scoreless between both of these teams. Uh in the second half, uh Pooj would hit one right to Kota, but then in the 58th minute, Leon got their much deserved it opener as Angel Mena would score from Rodriguez to make it one nothing in favor of Leon though Jovic did try to response uh for the Galaxy but he was denied by Kota Rubio then hits one right to Mikovic and the Galaxy again continue to uh have some problem in the back line and this time just turning the ball over like you just cannot afford to turn the ball ball over when you're already down one nothing in this one uh, Vines then hits it high from close, and then Puj would puts it wide from, from close range. And you know, as much as Leon was looking good in this point, you just wonder, you know, if this Galaxy team can hold this at one nothing, maybe they have a chance to, to tie the game up. And this was the chance as Le Leardown missed it wide, despite being wide open in the front post. I mean, that's one that he's got to bear. bear it. I mean, I know Kelvin Le Leardown isn't in your 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 typical great finisher as a goal scorer, but well, that 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 kind of space. He's got to bury, bury that one. But it didn't. It remains one nothing. The Galaxy was pressing late for the equalizer. Ambrez then had a shot that was denied by Mikovic. As Leon was also trying to kill this game off. And then boy, what puts it wide from long range. And in the end, Leon, they move. They are uh, able to get this win, and they are they are now pretty much moving on into the next round. And most likely gonna finish first place in the standings with a one nothing victory. Shots in this one, ten shots. Compare the 12 that Leon has, 5 shots on going for the 3 that the Galaxy had, 5 shots off target for the 4 that Leon has, 3 shots on his block for the 2 that the Galaxy had, and possession wise, 55% possession compared to the 45% possession that Leon has in this game. And I think this group that, that both the Galaxy, Leon, and Vancouver is in is kind of playing out the way I thought it was going to be. I think now it, it really goes down. Like, Leon is going to finish first, I, I know that for sure, but it's going to go down to that game between the Galaxy and the White Caps, and we'll see who. Who is going to get that that win? That most likely is going to to put the 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 team through as the second place team, and whoever lose that game is going to be eliminated from the from the the Leeds Cup tournament. But that being said, uh, moving on in terms of the next match. So so far, uh, we haven't had any team that has been eliminated just yet. But I will say that if there's one team that is really close of getting eliminated, is unfortunately my team. That is the San Jose Earthquakes because coming into this game. Timbers had to win against Tigres if the, the Quakes had any opportunity and all. Well, the Quakes still has a slight glimmer of hope, though. You know, they, they it would be, be just an, a, a Hail Mary for them to, to move on to the next round. Um, it kind of didn't help in this resort between the, uh, the, between the Timbers and Tigres as Tigres came from behind and getting the 2-1 the win against the Portland Timbers. Now, in the first 15 minutes, there wasn't really not much that happened. Uh, or there really isn't much that happened in this one as the shots were only 2 nothing through the first 15 minutes. There was a shout for a penalty for Tigris that was not given. And I feel like they had a legitimate shout because uh, Geniac, when he was trying to cross this one, uh, I think it was Paredes, the one that was sliding down uh, to block that, that shot. Actually, it might have been, been Moreno. It, it was one of the Timbers player that is. I thought it hit his hand. Like, I, I really did. I feel like Tigris should have got a penalty in this one. And refereeing decision would be a big storyline coming into uh, this one. Because, yeah, this was your typical CONCACAF level refereeing decision. Where, yeah, there was some really bad refereeing de decision that got gone against both teams in this one. Uh, in the 17th minute, the first shot for Tigres. Did see Angulo puts it wide from close. And then Evander would miss hit uh, a shot wide in the 21st minute. But he would not miss his hit his free kick in the 24th minute as he scored an absolute banger from the free kick. We know Evander can do do that, especially after watching the, the game that the Timbers play against the, the, the Quakes. And yeah, the Timbers were one nothing up. Genia did look for an instant response, but he was denied by Ivasic. And then Mora 
but heads it right to Guzman. And then in the 41st minute, uh, Gignac trying to do a little, little cute back heel there. That was actually denied by Ivicic. Uh, that goal wouldn't have counted, even if it goes in because the flag went up. But Gignac was not to be denied because in the 42nd minute, he would score from Lopez to tie the game up at one apiece. And to make matters worse for the Timbers, uh, they would also see red as Evander would get a red card in the 44th minute. It was actually his second yellow card, but I feel like he got CONCACAF in this moment. I mean... This was your 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 typical kind of Liga MX kind kind of players, and in this case, Lopez trying to reach out to your typical Liga MX dark arts or Concacaf dark arts of trying to to dive so that maybe you can get a player get get a red card or get a second yellow, and the referee we completely took the bait. I mean, you when you look on the replay, it was pretty clear that Evander barely touched uh, Lopez head there, and Lopez just kind of dives that down like he got shot or whatsoever, and yeah, uh, because. Because of the referee took the bait, it was a second second yellow, and Giovanni Savarisi mentioned this this call, and he was absolutely fuming, and I, I think he has every right to 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 do so. I mean, I I, I haven't agreed with a lot of things that Giovanni Savarisi have said, but that was one of those things. Though you could also argue the fact that that there was calls that 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 was bad on both sides, and this was one of the calls that gone against the the Timbers in this one, and they found themselves down ten men, and I I thought yeah. This is gonna be almost a miracle for them to 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 be be able to to pull pull off the resort against the almighty Tigres. And in the second half, with the score tied at one apiece, you kind of kind of sense that the Timbers were playing for penalty because Tigres really ramped up the pressure. Lopez would put it wide from close as it was Tigres having all the possession. Timbers were looking to play for for a penalty up to this point. Angulo would miss wide despite having a free header, and there was a huge shell for a penalty again. This time, Gignac thought that he was brought down by Paredes in the box, and I think he has a claim to that one too. In fact, I feel like this was even more egregious because it was pretty clear that it looked like Paredes brought down Gignac there, but hey, you know, if referee decision is going to be bad, at least it's kind of inconsistently bad uh, for both teams. I mean, that's not a good feeling because both teams would be frustrated, but you also kind of... If you want to play the devil advocate here, at least it's it's gone bad on on, on both both ways and haven't really caused a point where each of these fan base would say, well, this is the call that basically ruins it and the referee just sucked. Uh, when I'm pretty sure both fan base are basically saying that the ref sucked because of some bad decision that was made. Uh, though in the 66th minute, Herrera would struck the post on the header, and I thought the Timbers were walking on a very tight rope. Now, like you can see, Tigres they were knocking on the door. They were getting oh so close of getting that. That, that go ahead goal, and they finally did in the 80th minute as Angulo would score from Pizarro to make it 2 1 in favor of Tigres, and that was game set and match. Like, as soon as that one went in, I mean, you might as well just say lights out at Providence Park because because there was no chance for the Timbers to come, come back. They were just holding on for so long, hoping to get to the PK shootout. But as it is the case, whenever the Liga Emeki's team, team has the advantage, and especially when Tigres is involved, you know it's not going to go go well for the MOS team. And that was the case in this one as Tigres able to win 2-1 in this one. Shots in this one. Nine shots for the eight that Tigres had. Three shots on goal for the two that Tigres had. One shot off target for the five that the Timbers had. Five shots on the block for the one that the Timbers had. And possession-wise, 65% possession compared to the 35% possession that Tigres has in this one. And although the Timbers still are in a very good position right now to, to move on, you know, that still obviously depend on the game between the, the Quakes and Tigres. And also, if the Quakes does somehow win that game against Tigres, oh boy, then we get get into talk about go, go differential. And I believe the Quakes, obviously, with minus two, uh, Tigres with plus one, uh, the Timbers now with, with plus one. I think what, what will happen is that if uh, if the Quakes beat beat Tigres, uh, they th then the goal difference would be be dead even, and then we go into even the crazier uh, talk about how I think fair play might be might be the next next tie tiebreaker. It's gonna be very close. Like it it's gonna be some Leeds Cup kind of kind of chaos if if the Quakes can pull pull this one off. So again, yeah, it it's it just. You know, the good news for the Timbers is that they just have to hope that Tigres, of course, win and can show that same, same kind of fight, especially with the way that the Quakes look, look really bad in that game against the Timbers, besides maybe the first 30 minutes. Uh, maybe Tigres should be able to win, and especially Tigres has looked really good, good so, so or, or Tigres is definitely one of those teams that is is going to be one of the favorites in this tournament. But again, I think if you're a neutral and you want maximum chaos, you root for the Quakes to beat the 
beat Tigres and, and really puts a lot of question in terms of, well, what's the tiebreaker uh, go, going to be, be looked like as we head into the final day. But that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys like, smash the subscribe button. Let me know in the comments below what do you think of this busy action in terms of the Leeds Cup tournament that we ha had last night. Again, this will be the busiest that we get. We will never get like seven games in a single night uh, for the rest of the group stage action. In fact, we're only going to get four later t tonight, that is. But either way, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys like, smash the subscribe button. And yeah, I, of course, will see you guys next time.